Have a listen to this ad. Hey, Doc, what can a Newman Fear Nothing blood test really test? Kidney, liver, thyroid, heart, and more. So it can know a man's body, but can it know his mind? No. Interesting, interesting. Order your Fear Nothing blood test at newman.com. Does this strike you as a bit unusual? In a field of white coats and sterile brands who are too scared to stand for anything, Newman have really put their neck on the line and grown into one of the largest men's digital health companies ever. But how? I spoke to Socrates Papafloratus, the Greek immigrant founder of Newman. So Newman has raised like 70 to $90 million. So does that mean it's worth like valuation, what, like half a billion dollars, something like that? Well, you know, we raised the total of 42 million pounds in equity. And then we put another 10 million pounds of venture debt on top of that. So we raised the 2021 and we were valued at one point, you know, in time. Then we've grown the business massively since then across every single, you know, uh, metric you want to look at. Our valuation right now is something that, you know, will be determined when we, when we go out to raise again. Uh, but the valuation is not the thing that we're kind of fixating about um, valuations also of private companies is a number that is within your control to an extent and outside of your control. But we're happy with, with where it is. Uh, and we're happy also with the investors that we've got and the capital that we have to build the things that we want to build. So this isn't your first rodeo. This is at least your third this startup. Is my third. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What have you brought from those previous startups to now that if you know if you were to start Newman as a first time founder versus what you are today, like what are the differences in how you've approached everything? Well, uh, a ton of stuff. Also, I've been, um, I was lucky enough to be one of the first investors in businesses like Secret Escapes and Calm.com. And with Calm, I was actually with Alex, one of the founders uh, in San Francisco. I was there at the same time, figuring out what I'm going to do next while he was figuring out what he was going to do next. And kind of, I've seen that business from its very kind of first inception when Michael and Alex were first starting to to think about it. And that was like, uh, I can claim zero <laughs> credit for the success of Carl or to have any really deep insight as to how the guys was were doing it. But what I remember is just, you know, having uh, a drink with Alex when it was, there was nothing, right? No deck, no, it was an idea. Uh, and him saying, look, do you know, I know this sounds like, insane but i really think this could be a billion dollar business and we could be like the the nike of the mind that thing that people talk about now the guys talk about now they were talking about it from day one and back then this is now 2012 building a billion dollar business wasn't just you know of course you know you loser what else are you going to do rather than a billion dollar business it was really you know uh, inspiring difficult hard thing to do and that was the, the big shift was in how big you can and should think. Um, that's kind of the difference from, you know, now. And if you like my earlier part of the, of the journey, um, I'm a lot more comfortable now, not only trusting others, but recognizing where I need support and what I'm not good at. I'm a lot more secure in being wrong. Uh, and actually just accepting where people are experts, but also being comfortable having conversations and changing your mind with that and that being okay. Whereas when I, in my first business, when I was, you know, 27, that was a really difficult thing to do um, a, because of insecurity, right? I made also the decision with this business to raise a significant amount of money earlier on. So a lot more comfortable with dilution, with working with investors, with you know, giving control to investors, when you're going to work with investors and when you're going to raise multiple rounds, you, there are things that as a first time founder, I was, you know, I wouldn't have been able to, to handle. I would have been, again, extremely stressed about. Again, this is me being a first time founder in 2006 is very different to being a first time founder now. Um, if you like the education, the inspiration, the content and things like that, that you're, you're doing just didn't really exist back then. Uh, the sophistication also of investors on the other side wasn't there. So the, it's just a very, very different uh, world now. Can you explain the decision to raise aggressively early on? You know, you see founders like Jack Dorsey of Twitter, who I think by the end owned something like 3% of Twitter. And 
that's kind of given us an example of like why not to do this. So why were you comfortable with raising a lot of money aggressively early on and being willing perhaps to give away ownership along the way? Yeah, again, you know, 3% of a $50 billion company is not too bad, right? Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's also often, it's not necessarily the percentage of the business that you own. It is also the control that you have around certain key decisions around that business. The thing that you need to figure out is the the business that you're doing is it kind of does it have potential to be large enough to be able to sustain multiple rounds of fundraising and an increased kind of valuation to justify that which means that in the market needs to be large enough the opportunity that you're going after needs to be large enough the eventual outcome needs to be large enough so that it can make sense for you to do this if you're going to do that for a business that the kind of the con those conditions do not exist it doesn't really make sense to do that. Um, it's not always that easy to figure out. Sometimes it is really obvious, but what um, what kind of blurs things is when you have market conditions that are just extremely frothy, when you have things that are like the space that we're in and the, the decision that I made early on, and then I had to reconfirm it a little bit further down the journey, was what was my commitment when it came to this business, what was I kind of in this for, right? What I was, what was I prepared to commit to from a time, energy, um, psychology kind of perspective? And I wanted to do something that I could really see myself doing for 10 years, for 20 years, for as long as it took. And as long as the market that you're in is also expanding, it's okay to to be diluted. In fact, um, statistically, when in those conditions, the the founders that raise more capital, more aggressively, and win are the ones that get the the bigger outcomes. Uh, in the space that we're in, given also the competition that you mentioned, the timing component of it, there is no sense of kind of doing it in a in a half-assed way. Uh, you need to commit and you need to go after it in a big way. Having said that, if you can build a business that you bootstrap, that you have full control over, that you can get a range of outcomes that are fantastic for you and your family and your loved ones, and you can do it that way, go for it, 100%. There's quite a pivotal moment, I think, early on in your story where you're working for Saul, who's a Sequoia-backed startup founder. And along that time, you have the realization that successful entrepreneurs are not actually that smart or that amazing they're not you call them five-headed beasts they're just like regular people can you take me back to that moment and maybe what realization you exactly had there that led to where you got to today where you realize that okay these people are just like normal normal people yeah by the way let me let me start by saying that Saul is actually pretty freaking like <laughs> out there <laughs> he's uh he's super smart he's not just smart he's like uh Every way you look at it, like a really, really impressive uh, human being and a super cool guy. But when it came to actually the business part of it, uh, and I remember him saying this to me when I, when I kind of told him that I was leaving to start my, my own business. The most important thing in it often is, is common sense. It is not hyper intelligence. And also the things that make you successful is common sense. It is... Um, Emotional, if you like, stability and resiliency is the relationships that you build with people. It is the decisions that you make. It is the grit that you have. Intelligence, of course, helps. And there are founders there that are really hyper intelligent, like a Bill Gates. The man is a genius. But there is, if you were to trade intelligence with a lot of the other attributes, you would kind of trade it every time, right? Um, I've got a ton of people in the company that are a lot smarter than me. I hope, I'm pretty sure, but you, you need to kind of bring all the different elements uh, together. For me, the big realization was because I've, I've always knew that I was going to build my own business, right? My own business kind of wasn't exactly sure what it would be, but I knew that I was going to do it and most likely in technology, but I didn't really know what that kind of involved, what it looked like. And then when I met Saul, who was like ticked every box, like Stanford, uh, PhD, um, raised from Sequoia, um, again, super charismatic. But then when I spent time with him, it was, right, okay, fine, cool. Yeah, he's impressive, but, you know, there's nothing really here that is um, 
unattainable. And also when I saw some of the mistakes that he made, some of the people he had surrounded him with, some of the challenges that the business had, it was like, ah, okay. So even if you have like all of those things, it doesn't really matter, right? Therefore, it doesn't just necessarily follow if you're going to have those things, you're going to be successful. So it must be something else. It can't just be intelligence or some magical, mythical uh, skill. So it was kind of this um, demythy mystification uh, of kind of meeting somebody and been spending time in a startup that was uh, eye-opening for me. Can you tell me about your thoughts around quitting? Because I think the second business, Togetherer, which was a photo sharing app, you grew that to 65,000 users, I believe, and you were sort of head-on competing with Facebook. And then along the way, you basically quit. And the positive way of looking at that is like tactical quitting. You're like redistributing and going down like a more prosperous path. But then the negative spin on that is you gave up. So how, Mm -hmm. you know, in that particular example, that story or just across your career, how do you think about quitting? You need to change course when the course that you're in is wrong. So with Together, um, it was really a hindsight and also, I had I was given that advice from, from friends, right? You could see that we were caught in a sort of gray zone between... We had more than 65... I think we had more than 100,000 users at some point, but we were caught in that gray zone where you're not really growing virally and a product that is an inherently private product will never grow virally. And you were not monetizing it aggressively enough. So either you have a business that is like if you have a funnel you can monetize and you can spend money on marketing and you can grow that business or you have the business that can grow, the users will do the distribution, right? If you don't have either of those two things, you don't have anything. Just as simple as that. And you can come to that determination very soon. Like you need to know if your business is not growing virally the first iteration of your funnel and you will change that a few times around. But if your viral coefficient, let's say, is 0.1, you are never going to get that above one. If you're not going to get above one, you're not going to grow that way. If not enough people are prepared to pay for your service, then, you know, what is it that you're going to do? You need to think and do something different. Um, a big aha moment for me was when I was pitching this family office and I, I walked into that meeting and I was, it was in the bag, right? Because I knew that the guy was a heavy user of the app, him and his family and multiple families. He was like the ultimate use case. And he was a scion of a really, like he was worth, I don't know, hundreds of millions, if not billions. And I was pitching, I was like, do you have the premium version of the product? He's like, no. It's like, why? I don't like paying for apps. And that was like a light bulb that was like, we are screwed. This is not going to work. I could have arrived at that sooner, right? So quitting is absolutely the smart thing to do. And it's the right thing to do for you. First of all, you and your time, your team's time, and your investors kind of money as well. And in that order of priority. And I had it the wrong way around. I was really, you know, I take it very seriously, raising money, as I sh- everybody should. But my investors, and a lot of them were friends of mine as well at that point. We hadn't raised a lot of money. They're like, yeah, okay, cool. I mean, it didn't work out, shame. But they knew, like, I knew when I invest, like, if it doesn't work out, I have, like, zero negative. The only times where things, I, I like, the, you don't like is when you have people screwing around with, um, the idea with their time, but when somebody is really committed, they're trying really hard, and things didn't work out. That's totally fine. It's it's what it is. It's the nature of what we do. It you have to be like really bad at numbers or something wrong with you to not understand that you know this is a the the odds are stacked against you. So um, there's, there's nothing wrong with uh, changing course or even walking away from something when you know for sure that it's not going to work. <laughs> you have to try really hard to figure that out. The point is you can find out in the shortest amount of time. That's what you should be doing. So, Socrates, what's your superpower, would you say, as a founder? And let me chime in with what I think it might be based on what I've read about your story and also a lot of other people I've interviewed. And I call it the social R number. So when we had 
COVID, we had the R number, which was, you know, if one person gets infected, how many other people will they infect? And of course, if the R number is above one, that means that you kind of exponentially grow because, you know, one person gets infected and they infect more people, et cetera, et cetera. And you get this kind of exponential explosion. And I think that in a lot of successful founders or in any kind of industry, one big thing that I see is that people have a very high social R number. So when they have encounters, when they meet people, when they start businesses, that whole experience always results in like a positive sum. And even if things don't go well, you build mm-hmm. like positive relationships out of this. Whereas the converse to that, which is someone who's kind of an asshole that no one likes hanging out with, and they go around meeting people and they have like a 08 social R number where they meet someone <laughs> that person tells someone else you know, that's not a very nice person he's a b- bit of an asshole and etc cetera, etc cetera, and they kind of dwindle away so that's one of my takes on what's made you do well that you have I think a very high social R number you're very likable etc but do you have any thoughts on like what your superpower might be uh thank you first of all that's you know <laughs> uh it's good to to hear and it's actually uh I do use this as an interview question for senior people with a lot of experience. I do ask them to give me examples of uh, people that followed them in their career. And if you've been in senior positions and you've worked for 20 years or more and you cannot talk about that, there's something wrong. There's definitely something wrong. And, you know, with Together, uh, it didn't work out. Everybody in that, almost everybody in that company, we were, we were a small team, is a human. Uh, our VP of products, my co-founder, our director of engineering was our senior engineer together. Our head of mobile is, um, you know, was it um, together as well. So that is important. I think being able to, being able to keep those relationships, I think likable is important and being nice and not being an asshole is important. It goes deeper than that. It's uh, something that people want to, they believe that, they want to spend time with you. You can get them energized and you can also create a sense of trust. So even though you will go through intense times, I like intensity. I like being intense. I think it's a good thing. Uh, often when I talk to people, <laughs> sometimes you can see maybe, you know, for me, the words intensity and urgency are like they're positives. Like when are you doing something that you're really enjoying and it is not intense or urgent, right? When you're working out, when you're doing something physically demanding, where you're like, hey, there is a sense of intensity, but that doesn't mean that you can be an asshole to people or you can be disingenuous or you can take advantage of people. There's a lot of people often make the mistake that they'll see, uh, they'll confuse, they'll look at conf- winner bias and they will then take the wrong lessons. They will read somewhere that Steve Jobs was an asshole, therefore it's okay for me to be an asshole, to be successful, but they will forget like the billion other attributes that that person had to make them successful, right? Can I ask you to opine on this slash give your advice on this, which is the phrase or the question, do you need to be a dick to be a good leader? And the reason I ask is because I find it's a very difficult line to be nice, like be a nice person to people, but then also kind of get stuff done or be like seen as a leader. I find that if you're too nice, people, I think you get the impression, maybe this is in my own head, but I think you do get the vibe that maybe they don't respect me as much. And maybe when I'm a bit harder, I'm more of an asshole. People kind of respect me and see me as a leader. And I wanted to ask you as someone who seems like a very like nice person, and certainly that's what I've heard of other people, that do you ever have that tension where you're like, ah, like, you know, if I was a bit more of an asshole, like maybe stuff would get done quicker, I'd get less questions, you know, I'd be more respected. Is that ever something that goes through your head? Uh, it, it definitely doesn't. It's not, um, it's not been, I don't think being um, somebody who you are not is the answer, right? Um, the question is, like sometimes people, when you ask them to talk about, you know, when I ask them to describe our culture or when things talk to us when they when they first join us and they use the word nice, I don't like it. Um, I don't like it not because I don't think we should be nice, but I don't think anybody built anything great by being nice. Again, this is not about not being nice, but creating a culture of performance that is also a culture that is honest, that is authentic, that is direct, that it has also empathy. That is really hard. It's really difficult. And I wish I could tell you that 
I had the uh, the answer to this. It's something that we strive all the time to get better at. Um, and so much gets in the way in terms of um, decision making, velocity of decision making, feedback that you give to people. When you catch yourself that you feel like you should be saying something to a person, and you're not, that's when you're 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 doing it wrong. And this is where I've done it wrong. When I've kind of let things slide when I knew I shouldn't be letting them slide, not because I wasn't being nice, because I was being nice, but because I just didn't master the energy and the focus to actually do that. Um, but you you need to be able to you need to be ready to let people go. You need to be able to make sometimes those decisions really quickly. You need to kind of, you know, we've not let people finish their probation period because they were not the right fit. Um, and that's tough, right? Because you've hired somebody, you've screwed up. When that happens, we are the ones that made the mistake, not the person. Like our hiring process was the one that's wrong. And you've just taken somebody from a job that they had. That person has families. That person has a sense of, you know, self-esteem. That person has a career. You've brought them into the business. And then you're telling them, sorry, this is not, you know, we made a mistake. That's tough. But the alternative is just not an option. So you need to be able to do that. But then I'm like, you have to make sure this doesn't happen again. And you go back and fix whatever it is you got wrong to put you in that situation. Because I do believe, you know, companies and people are, you know, when people talk about we're family and stuff like that, I think that's bullshit. There's no, you know, you know the family, you're a team. It's a very different thing. And teams are strive for a goal. And teams sometimes, you know, need changes because the goal has changed or because the team is not performing. But the company has a responsibility to the person because it's like one individual and that's their whole life in your entire organization, right? So you need to be serious about how you do that. But you you need to do it. There's just no the the other the alternative is just your you're not taking your own time and the people that have believed in you and their time seriously enough. So I spoke to Sam Shah and Jacob Robinson at Newman, and they both said that if you speak to Socrates, you have to ask about the marketing. He's got some <laughs> amazing stuff on this. And just for the context, your marketing campaigns at Newman are just incredible. They're really kind of gregarious and i think seth godin would describe them as like purple cows they really do break the frame they're like really funny yeah. entertaining but they're also out there like you're putting your you're being the tall poppy you're putting your neck on the line you're being provocative with these campaigns mm -hmm. and i've got some specific questions but i just wanted to ask in general is there any insight you bring into how to do marketing well as a health or a health tech company uh, which maybe your competitors weren't doing because you're one of the first people I've seen on the scene doing something as kind of loud and gregarious as this. So like, what was your thinking there? Like, and how do you do it well? There's a lot of people that will tell you that mm, if you build a good enough product, people will find it. And if, you know, you do things right, then, you know, you'll get word of mouth. And it's something that just, it, it's so rare for that to happen. It does happen. It is literally capturing lightning in a bottle. If you are like a mere mortal and you're not Elon Musk and can create a global brand by just being Elon Musk and using Twitter and whatever else to create a mass following and build a brand that way, uh, which is, you can try, but it's, it's hard. Then you need to figure out a way to get people to hear about you uh, to get people to find you, to catch people when they're looking for you or for something else, and then to bring them to a place where you can actually convince them to trust you with their money, their time, and in our case, of course, really sensitive data as well. So um, we started with the like where everybody should start, uh, things that you can absolutely control, iterate, and learn from, which is performance marketing, paid search, and paid social. And then early on, we, we wanted to do two things. We wanted to be able to use non-auction-based channels. Um, and we wanted to be able to have a way to deploy spend, you know, marketing money um, in ways that would be more scalable than what search or social would allow you to do. 
we wanted to diversify our channel mix so we were not reliant on you shouldn't diversify too early you should figure out things that work and we also were lucky enough to try tv in a way that actually enable us to iterate and learn from so we started with really no budget at all like our first three ads cost like uh, an embarrassingly low amount of money but because we didn't know how to do it and we approached it from first principles we're like okay so we can't just do one advert right and the people that were speaking they're like well what do you mean we're like how will we know if it works or not or if it's so we should do at least three and test them. And we're able to negotiate some very favorable kind of rates when we started with TV. And then the first advert didn't work. The second advert didn't work. The third advert did work. And when I say worked, our kind of, our traffic was so small at the time and what we're doing was so uh, basic that you could really figure out easily whether something worked or not. It really showed up. Wait, can I interrupt? Since- why Why did you decide to do TV? Because that's like really traditional advertising. The common consensus is, look, that's dead. You need to use these algorithms. You need to use more modern stuff. Like why Why did you make the decision to use TV? You should 100% use the algorithms. Uh, you should use performance marketing, 100%. But then you also need to figure out what it is you, what's your message, what's your product, and what's your audience. In our case, we appeal a lot to men in that middle of life stage. And those men, a lot of them, what they do is they actually watch football, cricket, any kind of sport. So they they do spend time watching linear TV. And if you can get the numbers right in terms of like what it is that you pay for it, um, and if you can get your creative to work, then you can get it to work. What this also does is when you do have things like the changes in iOS, or when you do have things that kind of really affect your ability to reach people, then having your own brand and having built that brand actually starts to pay uh, dividends, right? So we that's how we approached it. I would be lying again to you if I said from the beginning, this is exactly how we're going to, you know, we plan it out and it all worked out. We tested it, we tried it, and then we just started learning um, really quickly, uh, especially during the first year uh, as we started on, on TV. And then after that, you get to a point where you have enough data to be able to make much better decisions. When it came to the creative, I met somebody that is in our team right now that was, I had spoken to a lot of people at the time when we're trying to figure out what it is we should be doing because we didn't know. And people were telling me a lot of things that to me just didn't make sense. Um, To the sense, like some of them just didn't make sense when I put two and two together. Some of them literally, I had no idea what they were talking about. And I I had a sense that it wasn't me it was them. <laughs> and then I met this person that came from that industry. And it was like, yeah, you're right. No, this is, they're just selling you what it is that they, you know, you went to these people that do this job. They're going to sell you what they know, what they believe, what they're trained to sell you, right? So we were going to media agents and, we're, and I was saying, give us a strategy. And they would give us a strategy that had, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. So it was do a bit of this, do a bit of that, and then do a bit of this. And we'll spend the money. And then what would happen? Well, then we'll see. And then we'll reevaluate. Which to me was just mad, right? If you have a small budget, you need to figure out the one thing that you're going to do. That if it works, you're going to be able to repeat and scale. If you buy an advert in a travel magazine. I remember somebody had pitched us digital screens at chicken shops. Where we would put adverts like (laughs) late at night. Because they had done this segmentation of the sesh in the city and the sesh were <laughs> bohemians that needed kind of medication to have sex because of their lifestyle and then the city were stressed out professionals so you would put an advert at city airport and then you do the chicken shops and these are like good people they're not like uh, clowns on the street these are like professionals and i was like that just doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever that's like surely this is but you don't know right and then um, Paul uh, met Paul and uh, we did a piece of work and we just really, um, we spent a lot of time talking about what it is that 
how I was thinking about the business, how I was thinking about what we're trying to do, how we thought about men. Paul came with like a viewpoint, which was centered around action and about doing something about the problem. And we tried to be as cut through on that because again, with the, with the issues that we're dealing with, they are really complex. Um, they are multifactorial. They can be physiological. They can be psychogenic. Every individual is so different. This kind of marketing buckets that people put in are abstract constructs that marketeers often create because they need to do that. And the one, the unifying thing that brings all of those things together is that you have a problem, you are aware that you have the problem, it is undeniable, but you are denying yourself the solution. And the thing that we need to do is to really just motivate you to just take action and take that first step and do something. And all the other stuff we're going to leave for you to figure out we're not going to patronize you. We're not going to hug you. We're not going to, but we're going to inspire you, motivate you, and basically just get your attention. The big thing that people are afraid of is how they're going to be perceived. How will they be misunderstood? What will happen next? The biggest problem is that nobody will care about what you're doing. That's it. And then nobody will do something about what it is that you want them to do. So this is where we zeroed in. And then it became like simple in a sense, not easy. Like how do you get a message across that motivates people to, to take action? And that's why our um, adverts are the way that they are. Uh, there is really deep thought behind them. There is marketing science behind them. You need to distinct it. A guy that I like, um, um, he's writing more than Seth Godin is Byron Sharp. Uh, from um, he's written books. Um, the the seminal book is How Brands Grow, where he talks about you need distinctive brand assets, and you need to make uh, relevant memory associations with a category. So when somebody thinks about the category, they think of you. And when you invest in marketing, your assets are distinctive that they stand out. And when I read that book, it really made sense to me. I was like, okay, I get it. And also from a neuroscience and kind of from memory and the way that behavior works, it kind of worked. The other stuff just didn't resonate at all. And uh, we stayed true to that. And it's been uh, one of the best decisions that we we made in the business. I want to talk about your brand identity of Newman and some of the risks and opportunities you've had there. Now, Seth Godin talks a lot about tribes. So when you're making a brand, it's more about starting a tribe of people. And it's very obvious how Newman's kind of a tribe. And the thing with a tribe is that not only do you need to be clear about what you are for, but you also need to be clear what you're not. And mm -hmm. one of the risks I can see in a brand like Newman, where you're kind of, again, gregarious, loud, you're capturing people's attention, you're very straight to the point, you're very kind of, I don't know if this is how you would describe it, but I would say like anti-establishment. We are not We are not the old guard. We are not the boring mm -hmm. health brand that's like very clinical and sterile. And, you know, you get all your results to like six decimal places. We are like the cool new uh, movement that's been started. But I guess that brings loads of opportunities. But one of the cons is, is that when people are dealing with their health, this is very serious stuff. They mm -hmm. might see a billboard of like a big wiener in Times Square with Newman's brand on it. And they're like, who are these yeah. jokers? I mean, I'm this is my health. Like I want some serious adults in the room to to be dealing with this. So is that a risk you've taken? Is that, and how have you thought about it? And has that had some negative consequences as well as some good ones it is a risk um and again in in those kind of uh in that when you're taking that approach if you do not take a risk um you are taking a risk i you're just not going to be effective um you're not going to be able to get that attention you're not going to be able to get people to remember you if you do stay only at that, then you will alienate people and you will lose people. So when we do take people on a journey, we do stress a lot more after that, the fact that, you know, we are a registered healthcare provider that's been, you know, <laughs> twice suspected and rated as good by the, the CQC, that we operate um, ethically, that we source, you know, we procure 
medicine the way that you know that people can trust us. Um, but yeah, it's um, there's no. At some point, you need to make decisions on this, and you need to, to choose, and you need to figure out what the trade-offs will be. The problem is that you cannot really be sure. Um, we do the thing we do is that we do survey and we measure the brand, and we do that every six months or so, and we do ask people around trusting about them, trusting us about how they feel. And often again, right, it's not the things that you may believe from the outside. They're not necessarily what people believe on how they think or how they act. Um, and also you find the people that are going to, you're going to resonate with and the people that you don't, and that's fine because you will go after and, and win that part of the market. And are investors or other stakeholders in your business do you ever get some heat from them where they're like, we've given you this money and you just run a seven figure ad campaign with pictures of cockerels and wieners in Times Square on billboards and TV ads? They're like, what What are you doing with our money? Do you ever get that? <laughs> um, <laughs> our investors, uh, we uh, governance wise, we, uh, as you'd imagine, uh, we do go into quite a lot of depth and you know our investors are on our board. We do have budgets that we work with. We do have plans. Uh, we do. We don't share every creative with with our investors. But when the people that invested in the business invested in the business, they took a very deep look at what we do and how we work and what we believe and why we do the things that we do. And they they decided to invest. It's not like we we sprang it on them as a surprise after that. Uh, but you know, this is where, again, we go quite deep when it comes to these things in terms of data, in terms of performance, we, we are, if you like the, the hardest critics on ourselves often on these things, because it's, um, obviously, you know, our investors capital. And again, I talked to just like a really quick one on this, right? Cause I, I talked to this about, about this issue with the team as well. The investors that we have money, like VCs, raise money from, um, they can raise money from ultra high net worth individuals. And we do have people that have invested in the business that are, you know, worth a significant amount of money. But also a lot of the money that comes to us is money from pension funds. It's money from people's mothers and fathers and families. It is not just people that are looking to hit IRR targets because they want to be on the Midas list or whatever. They're using that money. They're working for that money to get a good return for it. That will actually go back to um, the people that again are, are are parts of our families. So they we do take it. You know, I'm certainly aware of that acutely, and I want the team to be aware of that as well. But often there's a level of, of abstraction of kind of it's VCs that have all this money and they just spend it on businesses so that they can uh, they can they can do well themselves. Uh, but it's not. It's not only about that. I hope you don't take this badly, but you have this kind of charismatic aura of like, almost like an Adam Newman type figure where you, you know, apart from all the bad stuff, but in, in a good way, you have this <laughs> <laughs> like enchanting, charismatic leader kind of vibe, which I think probably is quite attractive for people. And if I just specify the exact question I'm asking is, you know, sell people on the vision, get them really on board. Is there anything that you've learned to do or is it just something that's kind of come naturally to you? Uh First of all, I don't know whether to say thank you or <laughs> or not. I'll take the compliment though. Uh, Adam Newman, for all, everything that happened with WeWork, uh, you can't deny the man was an absolute, you know, uh, like genius when it comes to selling that that vision. Um, we definitely don't have the parties that they had with uh, with WeWork and Newman, where I'm a lot more boring than that. I, I, it's not something that I've consciously um, cultivated or trained or or thought about, right? But it is really important, though, that you you are able to do this. Where you need to be really, and this is maybe something that I don't do as well as I could. I'm a little bit, I'm conscious of. Um, the line that exists between selling a vision and lying, misleading, right? And that line is not that um, that easy to see sometimes. Sometimes it is really easy to see. But when uh, I was watching the, what was it called? The uh, the program with uh, Jared Leto, the WeWork, the one on Apple TV. I don't know if you've seen that series. It's really good, yeah, yeah. Or when you saw the, the dropout, 
with Liz Holmes. Uh, it's the story of Theranos. And, you know, you see them talking about the vision, the mission, about getting people excited, and you're like, hang on a sec. Uh, but where the draw, where they went wrong is when, uh, when you compromise your integrity or when you make up something or when you lie, and then you get into this kind of spiral of having to cover the lie with another lie, and then it's too late to kind of change that, and you find yourself in dark places, and especially if you're in the U.S., really good chance you're going to end up in prison. Like it's, um, uh, Clayton Christensen talks about this, uh, about one of the things that he does in his lectures, he tells people about um, how many of his graduates ended up in prison, like <laughs> the CEO of Enron. The, um, you know, you registered the point. You, you're, I'm a, the registered manager for uh, our business, right? So um, the fine for uh, getting things wrong, apart obviously in other businesses, I used to say, you know, nobody will die uh, with what we do. In our case, it's not nobody will die. Somebody will die because we deal with patients. And at some point, given enough time and given enough patience, unfortunately, somebody that is in our care for something it might be an unrelated, of course, condition, but they're patients and we need to treat that really seriously, right? Or the things that we do, the ultimate fine is imprisonment. If you screw things up uh, with the MHRA or with the CQC, we are. <laughs> but that's something you have to take really seriously. And you need to be able, though, at the same time to motivate people. You have to have an exciting vision and you need to have that passion that you can, you can convey and you can communicate, right? And it's something that uh, it always came naturally to me. It's uh, maybe a bit of an aside here. Um, in my first business, we raised half a million pounds, myself and my co-founder, uh, when we had like nothing. And in hindsight, I mean, we had the website and it had like 12,000 visitors a month or something. And when I look back at the, I found randomly one day the, the, the deck that we had, it was pitiful. It was just absolutely shocking. And then we met um, How's That, Hugo Burge and David Soskin. And they and, and Hugo, unfortunately, passed away. Um, uh, I'll, I'll talk about Hugo in a second because he, he taught me a bunch of really important stuff. But they invested in us half a million pounds. Um, we grew the business. We worked together. We sold the business. And then after, you know, we exited, we're celebrating and stuff. I said to Hugo, like, you know, how did you, why did you invest in us? <laughs> and he's like, you were really passionate about it. And I was like, um, was that it? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Uh, is that kind of all, uh, all it would take? He's like, yeah, uh, it was, it really came through. And then I was speaking to somebody else that, uh, one of our other investors and they, it, they, they really talked about how it's the thing that they're looking for is like really people who are passionate about what we're doing with a big vision that they believe in and they want to support, right? Because that's what you need if you want to deploy capital to be able to grow a business. You need to find somebody that you can believe that they want to do this, right? And this is not something you can fake. Um, you have to be able to, to have that passion. And if you don't have it, you shouldn't be starting a business. You shouldn't be doing it. Um, and that's kind of what I learned when, uh, with my second business, I really, you know, I loved our product and everything else. I can't say I was as passionate about it. I didn't feel it in the way that I feel this business and how I felt my, my first business. So Hugo was, uh, he taught me a lot about this and it, I didn't realize it in my first business when I was 27. And also I was a little bit, I didn't think uh, Hugo had on his LinkedIn passion as one of his core strengths. I was like, fuck, passion. Like, this is, you know, that is the weak, right? And I was just so immature. And I learned that from, from him the hard way. When I tried to do something, I wasn't as passionate. And then it was so painful to go through that experience. Unfortunately, Hugo passed away a few weeks ago at 51. And it's, um, it's heartbreaking. And I so regret that I didn't make more of an effort to see him and spend time the the, the intervening few years because he he was the CEO of Cheap Flights. He um, ran that for 17 years, exited for 500 million, took over Marchmont House in Scotland, turned into a center of the arts and kind of uh, 
He invested in businesses like he was the, C, the chairman of Motorway. He was just such a brilliant, charismatic, like great person. And yeah, he um, unfortunately he he, uh, he passed away a few weeks ago. But uh, that's one of the things that he was really very clear eyed about how important it was. I really like to kind of analyze and dissect interesting, charismatic people that I interview but also look to historical examples and, you know, even people like cult leaders, populist leaders, just try and understand how they inspire people with their vision. And I've got two theories on this. So I think the first theory is that they inspire people because you've mentioned this kind of passion, but I think on a deeper level, it's this magnetism of certainty. Someone who's passionate gives off a very certain energy and they give this vibe off that they're a train going forward and that you can either get on the train Mm -hmm. Or you don't and you miss it. And I think that's one thing about people that I notice who are very charismatic. They give off this energy of I'm a train barreling forward, either get on or get out the way sort of thing. And then the second thing I think is quite important with these people is that they aren't always the main character themselves. They sometimes, we talk about main character syndrome a lot. It comes up on TikTok a lot. But I think they have a way of making you feel like you're the main character. When you speak to them, they really instead of maybe talking about themselves, they can sometimes give you the energy of like, you could go out and achieve anything. And I think that's something that's really overlooked. So I guess those mm. are my two learnings that I think that really charismatic, inspiring people that people like to be around do is that they make you the main character or they're giving off this really like, I'm a train hurtling forward vibe. I don't know what you think of that. That makes, um, that does make sense. I'm, I haven't followed what main character syndrome is. I am, um, <laughs> I haven't over over analyzed this to be to be honest with you. Uh, maybe I I should. I think storytelling is really important. Storytelling is um, it's an art and it has a structure to it as well. And I think you can and should spend time to. I haven't spent anywhere near enough time, and I think I I need to. It is important. It is imp it is it's one of the great ways to create value for your your business and again it's like a bit like a passion where you don't fully appreciate especially if you come more from um engineering kind of utilitarian functional kind of background you tend to put a little some of those things behind like you know it's the facts and but actually a narrative uh and a story it's like a really deep human need and it's also amazing how much it impacts even public companies, right? It's your your equity story that you're building. And it is a story. And it's, it can't be science fiction. It goes wrong when you stay in the story for too long and your execution doesn't really catch up. Uh, but you do need to have that. It's a really powerful force. Um, and yeah, I think getting people to believe that they can do it, giving people also a sense that Again, somebody said this to me in our Christmas party, which meant a lot to me. He said that I, I I feel like, you know, we will be okay. That even if things go wrong, you will tell us and you will communicate and we will figure it out. And for me, that is really important. Like, I don't want people to believe like Socrates will, you know, lead us to the promised land and it's kind of the train and everybody get on board and we'll, we'll get there. I want people to feel like, you know, it's up to us and it's down to us and if it's not us, then who else? Like, I genuinely believe that there isn't anybody out there that has any more, if you like, right strength, talent, skill, whatever, that can do what it is that we're setting out to do. It doesn't mean that, you know, success is guaranteed or anything like that, but it, there is no ceiling or what it is that you can achieve as a team, you just don't really know. And it's silly to try to impose a ceiling, right? You have to be pragmatic, all that kind of stuff. You just need to have the belief that you will figure it out. You're going to be wrong about a million things. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to screw up. You're going to have setbacks. But you will figure it out. And as long as you believe that, especially as a team, it becomes really, really powerful. I think a lot of entrepreneurs are very dishonest about their motives. Like, one thing I always hear is, you know, uh, when people talk about how they do everything for their family and it's like, really, you know, you could kind of get like a six figure job, be pretty comfortable, work 40 hours and you could spend a lot more time with your family. So I think that's, I don't believe that. And the second thing is when they talk about their grand 
like what motivates them is their vision for the world. And I think I don't <laughs> discount that that's probably some a, a thread running in their mind. But I think on a deeper level, it's I think it's majority ego. Like, why would you try and go out and build something great? There's that quote, which is like, you know, why did you climb that mountain? And then someone replies, because it was there. And it's this kind mm -hmm. of thing about ego and conquest and all of this. And that to me seems like, especially venture backed founders, I think that 90% is ego. So <laughs> do, you, do you have anything to like, do you have any thoughts on, on what I've said? Do you know, I, um, I remember again, you have like, uh, with a conversation we've had, like, there's a few it brings us up moments in time that you kind of, I remember really vividly and really clearly, right? So I remember yeah. having this dialogue with myself when I was doing my master's. I was living in Beckton. It was actually a really low point in my life for a number of reasons. And I was thinking about why, because I really wanted to do this, right? Uh, this meaning creating something, building something, um, achieving something difficult. And I was trying to figure out why that was. Was it um, issues with authority? Was it ego? Was it uh, money? Was it... Um... At the end of the day, I ended up at the conclusion that I just wasn't going to really try to figure it out and dig you deeply into it. I just wanted to freaking do it. So I was going to do it. Why do I still do it is a good question. Um, and it's something to do for me with like creativity and with achievement and with challenges and just kind of being attracted to really hard things. Um, the why behind all of those things, I just don't dwell on it too much i just know that it's there and i've tried to kind of not do it and do something else and just can't so that's that's as deep as it goes i'm afraid um yeah. I, yeah no i get that like what's the point of psychoanalyzing it too much i mean what's it gonna achieve i guess um yeah it doesn't really you should do it if you're not really sure or if you're doing it for the wrong reasons like if you're saying that you're doing it for your family that's you know if you <laughs> patently not true <laughs> if you're doing it for the world maybe for some people um they they're they some people do have a higher calling and the sense of like innate mission that is almost kind of religious they're really uh rare uh but yeah um i just want to do it because it's i'm interested i'm drawn to it i like creating things i like to kind of achieve difficult challenges because we have a short time um, on this planet and that's what I kind of get my motivation get my kicks from from doing I hope you enjoyed that episode you can find all my links by going to bigpicturemedicine.co.uk and if you've been enjoying the podcast then please consider leaving a review and by the way all of these episodes are now available on Spotify and on YouTube in video format thanks for listening <laughs>